name is Ann Billisbach, and I'm happy to welcome you to the Nebraska State Historical Society's Brown Bag Lecture Program. Uh, it's held here at the Nebraska History Museum on the third Thursday of every month. Um, and you'll find a detailed schedule for this series, um, as well as information about other historical society programs and activities on our website at www.nebraskahistory.org. Um, and before I introduce the speakers today, I want to thank the Nebraska State Historical Society Foundation. Um, they fund the uh, taping of these uh, programs for us, and that allows us to broadcast those on uh, Lincoln cable access uh, channels and also to post them on YouTube. So people who can't make it to this program or who want to relive it and listen to it again have an opportunity to do that either on cable access or on uh, YouTube. Uh, we have two presenters today. We, we only advertised one, but we actually have two. Um, and uh, they are John Carter and David Murphy. Um, both of them are senior staff here at the Nebraska State Historical Society. And we were talking about it beforehand. And, Combined, they have more than 80 years of expertise uh, and, and work at the society. So you're getting a real deal with uh, the two of them. Um, the title of the talk is A New Look at the Old Side House. And John Carter is going to be presenting first. And he'll, uh, they'll both be presenting new information and insights on South construction in the West. So welcome, John Carter. Uh, thank you all. Um, if, well, it hasn't been that long ago that if you had said, John, I want you to work on finding something new and interesting to do with sod houses, I would have laughed at you. Uh, really, I thought that field had been plowed a long time ago. Uh, but as is the case with a lot of things, all of a sudden, something pops up and then something else pops up and it gets more and more interesting and that's the case with sod houses and it's what David and I are going to talk about today. Now the reason David wasn't on the promotional material was, uh, well let's put it this way, I asked him if he would like to join me today to talk about some of his research and I made a really compelling argument. I said if you don't do this, I'll do it and take credit for it. <laughs> it didn't take much deliberating. Uh, so at any rate, we're going to start with some of the things that David has learned about uh, uh, the origins of sod houses. Again, a story that I thought long ago was over with. And then when he's done with whatever time we have left, I'll look at a couple other things. So, David Murphy. Uh, one of our guests observed as we were walking in today that he was looking forward to today's talk because there was a great public speaker involved. Just want to let you know he's next. Uh, um, I started this work oh, way back in the 80s and then somehow it just got stuck because of other projects. And it's been something of a challenge. John had an intern, I think last year, involved with producing an e-book for the public schools on sod construction, so I had to start digging out some of my files. And I was doing a lot of it from memory, but today I decided I better really dig into the files to make sure I wasn't telling you lies. Um, so it's been something of a challenge being a latecomer to this to put things together. Um, in term, one of the big questions, and it's not a big question to everybody, but to some people is where in the world did the idea of sod construction come from? Roger Welch, of course, back in 1968, hypothesized that the idea maybe came from the Omaha Earth Lodge by way of Mormons building sodies at winter quarters in the north part of Omaha. That would have been 1846. I always had trouble with the earth lodge idea because sod construction is a massive wall construction where it's bearing weight. And the earth lodge, of course, you've got 
sods that are covering the, it's a membrane over the top of the earth lodge, so that's kind of a different idea. Um, and then the research I've done so far on the Mormons at winter quarters, I haven't found a single documented uh, instance of a Saudi being built there. They're all log buildings. The chimneys were built out of wattle and daub, which is a very old technique. There may have been a couple of sod chimneys built. Uh, that's as near as I can come to any connection there. Um, others have postulated German-Russian origins uh, up in North Dakota, for example. Uh, two problems with that. And I'm not going to go into detail on all these, but two problems with that are the German-Russians arrive quite late compared to the pre-existing sod constructions out here. And number two, the research that's been done on that wasn't done with field work. And subsequently, a number of colleagues have done research in North and South Dakota on the German-Russians. And primarily, they're building out of adobe brick, rammed earth, and puddled clay. So they may have adopted sod construction at some point, but we still don't have any evidence that they used it over in, in the Black Sea area of Russia. Um, another theory was the Irish sourcing, and of course it's kind of compelling because we know uh, Irish turf houses, they're quite different. Uh, the major immigration, of course, the timing might be right, but they're certainly not out here at that time. And so that, we don't have any good evidence for that. Um, rather, I want to try to as firmly establish some evidence in a particular time and place, and I think it produces a pretty compelling story. Not only a story in terms of the origin, but from which this whole technology kind of disseminated across certainly the rest of Nebraska at any rate and perhaps other parts of the plains. The story is pretty, pretty intimately tied to another one. And when I first discovered this connection, it was in, in, in the process of doing some research on clay building technologies on the, on the plains. Now it could be that we're, this is a very complex story and it could be that the sod story is really this complex as well. What we had in terms of clay was an early introduction by fur traders out on the Western Plains, adopting Hispanic technologies. For example, uh, the forts on the South Platte River and Bent's Fort down on the Arkansas River. The, we're talking about 1830s constructions. I might point out Fort Vasquez, 1835, because I'll get back to that later. That's on the South Platte. I'm not sure. I guess, do we have a pointer? Um, the top one here. It was the first one of all those South Platte forts uh, built out of adobes, and some of these forts actually hired uh, Mexican laborers to come up and build, build them. Um, so the fur trade introduces it, and then the army adopts it uh, right after the Mexican War and starts building adobe construction in a lot of their western forts. Uh, one of the major buildings at the new Fort Kearney out on Grand Island, Nebraska, 1848, the storehouse was built out of adobes at, at that time. Uh, the army adopts it and then it pretty much ends. But we do have another later reintroduction of various clay technologies that happen that are brought by European immigrants uh, the Hispanic population comes up into western Nebraska uh, even late, around 1900 or a little later, and they build adobe buildings out in Scotts Bluff and some of those rural areas. Czechs, Germans from Russia, and, and other Germans and Polish people also already knew about clay construction and reintroduced it on their own later on. So that kind of complexity may be involved here, uh, we don't really know yet, so there's a whole new uh, research agenda that probably will develop from this. We'll get into that a little more later. But I want to go back to Fort Kearney now. It was established, uh, Lieutenant Daniel Woodbury uh, was charged with locating new forts to protect the Oregon immigrants by law, and he came out in 47 
uh, found the site at Grand Island, established the site, and then wintered over at the old Fort Kearney, which is at Nebraska City, uh, and then <coughs> took the troops out in 1848 and started constructing. Uh, he gave pretty detailed reports on what was available to him, and one of the biggest ones was a lack of building material. He didn't really know what to do. Uh, I want to quote from one of his reports. The bottoms, and he's talking about the area around Grand Island now, the bottoms at many places examined are nearly pure sand below the surface stratum. This stratum is sometimes two to three inches, sometimes 18 inches deep, consists of sand, clay, and gravel in varying proportions. In almost all the cases, the proportion of sand is too great or the stratum too thin for brick. Uh, interesting. Either common or sun-dried. There is, however, six or seven miles west of the site, a deep and extensive stratum of which common bricks can be made. Captain Sublet thinks that both of these strata will make good sun-dried bricks and that the climate will justify their use. I will remark here that I regard myself as fortunate in the selection of that officer to command the escort. He was uh, in charge of Company A of the Missouri Volunteers. In connection with an Indian trading company, he has lived many years upon the mountains, traveled often upon the Platte, is familiar with the timber and other resources and characteristic of that river, well-versed in woodcraft and in knowledge of the Indian character and habits. He is familiar with adobe work and has put up several buildings of that material. I found him at all times more than ready to lend me every assistance, and we have frequent, frequently benefited by his judgment. Captain, Captain Sublette was in partnership with Louis Vasquez uh, out on the South Platte River in the 1830s. He traveled up and down the plains, had wintered over in Taos and Santa Fe uh, on some winters but was there and was in, intimately involved with the construction of Fort Vasquez, which was Adobe Construction, 1835. Now he's in the Army uh, with the Missouri Volunteers. In the next report, this is an 1849 drawing of Fort Kearney, the way it existed when Wilkins, on his way to California, came through. So we do know a little bit about what the fort looked like. In Woodbury's second report, however, in July of 1848, he, instead of doing, building everything out of adobe, he was kind of running out of time. And he details that he has 175 men, 20 of them are molding and burning bricks. This would be for fireplaces and chimneys. 60 are molding adobes. 25 working as carpenters, 20 building a sod stable, and 50 hauling and laying adobes. Continued rains during the last week of almost entirely suspended operations in making adobe. Now, interestingly, there's, there was no fanfare about his use of sod in building a stable. Uh, it makes you wonder kind of that it just appeared we still don't know, there's still kind of a question as to how this whole thing comes about, but none of his superiors ever questioned him about uh, cutting sod and building a building out of it. At any rate, with the passage of time, it turned out that only the big uh, storehouse, which is the biggest building over on the right, was built out of the adobe bricks. All of the officers' quarters and barracks that year were built out of sod. Uh, I'm going to go over and point at the main side buildings. Officers' quarters and barracks over here. So, with the time constraints on making the adobe, sod ends up winning the day. Now, we know a little bit about them, a little bit more. Uh, we have several people who observed the appearance of the port of the fort at that time, they weren't very um, praising of the situation. <laughs> and there's a lot of very interesting comments, but I just want to hit a few. A couple of quotes here. Fort Childs, on a bend of the river, 
and built of unburned mud bricks presented but a sorry appearance. The fort has much the appearance of a hacienda in Mexico. Another one, the sod buildings look comfortable, reminding me of a Mexican rancho. Fort Kearney is altogether a different sort of place from what I expected to find. Not a stick of timber can be seen on this side of the river, and the timber on Grand Island opposite is very sparse. There are about 20 occupied houses at the fort, all constructed of mud, cut in oblong blocks from the prairie, roofed with poles and mud. Major Osborne Cross, who came through in 1849, also, and a very astute observer, what few buildings were inhabited, I observed, were made of sward cut in the form of adobes. So the sod connection with the adobe connection is very prominent, not only in terms of the material being used, but in the way the buildings actually look. And they do very much look like Mexican buildings. The vigas sticking out, you can see the very low pitched roof. The only thing that's unique is the large chimneys that appear on all these buildings. And they're large because when you're building a sod chimney, it takes more bulk and mass to actually get the job done. <coughs> At any rate, they continued to build the sod then. This is an 1849, 1859, excuse me, drawing by an artist named Hitchings. And he got enamored with the old sod, one of the old sod barracks, which was falling down at that time, about 11 years after they were built. Uh, you can see that they did use poles on the inside to help support the roof. They were uncertain, were not using the sod as a uh, structural material yet at this time. And actually, I'm going to go point out the thickness of the wall. Right here, you can see the cross section from part of the sod wall. And of course, this is sod over here. It's a very thin wall. We're used to hearing about sodies built with three foot thick walls, but you can see how narrow that wall is. And that is very characteristic of the Mexican or the Indian and the Spanish way of putting up uh, certain kinds of adobe buildings. Uh, they continued to use the sod. Uh, thank you. They continued to use sod even after they started building the frame buildings. This is an 1858, I think, photograph of the fort. Um, if we zoom in, you see a piece of the adobe storehouse on the far left, the big building in the background, and the little piece of sod building in front. And then off at the back, you can see one of a crude, non-Hispanic form for an early sod building. Uh, still rather crude, but more like we begin to see settlers start to build later on. Another photograph. Uh, I think they built some new adobe, or new sod buildings in 1856 or 57, and I think that's what we're seeing here. You see a very old crude one on the far left, and then the, the barracks or officers' quarters on the right is pretty well established, like the kind of sod construction we're looking at. So there may be an evolution of the sod construction going on at the fort, before the fort is closed down, so, which is very interesting. We start from the very crude ones, and I think we end up with massive wall buildings in the end. Now, we know a little bit, what's the connection here? The real connection is that there's a very old tradition in the American Southwest of adobe being built out of sod. And it, the, the correct term for that is terrones. Uh, terrones are cut from the sedge meadows of the Rio Grande Valley. Uh, they're cut with a spade. Uh, it's a sustainable form of construction in that they will dig out an area and then they'll let it go back. And it takes like 16 plus years before a cut over area has reestablished its vegetation sufficiently to allow cutting for new Terrones. This is a view down in the valley around Isleta, Pueblo, which is one of the famous places for the use of terrones 
construction. Let me uh, read a quote to give you more idea of, about the material. I think you'll find it very much like our sod. Taronis are earth construction bricks cut directly from the natural sod of sedge meadows, and by that it means damp. The sedges grow in damp soil, and then they're dried in the sun. Such bricks have been used for several hundred years in the Rio Grande Valley, and today are produced commercially by Spanish and Indian workmen. They are used chiefly by these two population groups, but, some, but to some slight extent by Anglos also. Although the Taronis are familiar objects to thousands of New Mexicans, we have been in, excuse me, I'll just skip that part. Uh, much of the land, this is a quote from an oral history, much of the land close to the river was Viga, sod-grown bottom lands, which could be cut into, into Taronis, the favorite building block of this area even today. And that area is the middle Rio Grande Valley extending south of Albuquerque and north of Albuquerque. North, it includes the Sandia Pueblo, which is largely built from Taronis as well. The best cutter of Taronis down around Isleta, according to local tradition, lived at La, La Constancia, southernmost of the settlement of the Tomes Grant. He is said to have marked out with a taut st string and cut as, with the spade 1,000 Taronis per day about 400 more than any now claim. Uh, cut with spades, dried in the sun, laid dry or in mortar. Uh, they're laid mostly as headers, and I'll show you some more of that later on. From another uh, oral history north of Albuquerque, uh, Hispanic gentleman talking about the house his mother built from Taronis. The house was made of Taronis, at the time, they didn't build with adobes as much as with taronis. They were better insulation than adobe because they have natural grass in them. They are cut from the ground in rectangles and taken out of the ground and laid to dry until they are able to use them. Adobe is made out of mud and is packed. There is no breathing to it like you have with a taron. Used as material, this is, was used as material then from Bernalillo in the north of Albuquerque down to Los Lunas in the south. Both Isleta and Sandia Pueblos are nearly entirely bit, built of Tyrone. This is the church, San Antonio at Isleta, built in the 1600s, and it's built entirely of Tyrone. Uh, it's been plastered now, but as late as 1910, it had stood for a couple hundred years unplastered. Now the thing about Taronis is it withstands water very, very well. You can put an adobe brick in a bucket of water and within a couple of days it'll be, it'll be totally gone. You put a Taron brick in water and after weeks it's still held together. So it's better for withstanding rain, uh, flooding and so forth and so on. It's a very good material. Now of course, then about by 1920 they had plastered it, but you see the stacks of Tyrone uh, sitting by the church uh, ready to be used for another project. Um, this is the detail of a Tyrone wall at Isleta Pueblo, and you can see the salt grass is the major uh, marsh grass that makes a good Tyrone brick. <coughs> and it grows down you see most of the roots in the first two inches or so, but they're really, really fine roots that go much deeper, and that's what's holding these blocks together. This one is mud plastered to hold the wall together. Um, another wall, and you see a lot of walls down at Isolato that have not been plastered. Uh, I think may maybe a, the oldest buildings are probably plastered by now because eventually they will erode after a few hundred years. But it's quite interesting. You can see a newer one in the center there. Um, and then this is a wall. This is a Historic American Building Survey photograph from the 30s down at Isleta. And you can see these Tarons are extremely large blocks. So there's some variety in terms of the size that they can cut them. The thing about when you do that cutover, the rhizomes from the salt grass is are still evident deeper down, and it re-vegetates itself 
over a period of a couple of decades uh, from those existing rhizomes. Um, this is north of Albuquerque, the Bledsoe or Barella Bledsoe House built about 1850. It's a Spanish style building, but it's built out of Taroni, and the wall in front is unplastered Taroni. Uh, it, of course, over, well, 150 years old, and the wall looks like it does need some plastering work. But. Another house quite interesting because I think if you recall the buildings at Fort Kearney, this is two construction episodes. You can see the line and different construction. If you take half of it, you have a shed roofed building uh, with, the, in this case, joists sticking out. At Fort Kearney, they were more heavier beams and looked more like bigger. Uh, it's a placito compound. Uh, you can see another feature back on the outbuilding where leveling lumber has been put into the wall. And that's a feature that we see occasionally in Nebraska as well. Another thing to look for is that a lot of these buildings are just laid as headers. So you probably have a wall 12, 14 inches wide and all of the blocks are laid this way. Um, that takes a certain amount of skill, and, but I think that's probably the way they were laid at Fort Kearney. You, I showed you that real narrow profile of the barracks wall. Uh, probably 12 inches wide or so. Uh, I think further evidence of the, the connection here, just the detail of that wall where you can see the sod. <coughs> now, there's a lot of similarities and we've been pointing some of that out. The form of the building, that early shed roof, the low pitch, the cross sections of the wall, and the archaeology that's been done at Fort Kearney, the wall thickness was no more than 12 inches uh, in most of the cases that they dug up. So the, those early buildings were not massive wall constructions the way we think of Saudis today. Um, the sourcing from wet meadows. Now, you may recall when I was talking about the Woodbury's report of the soil strata, I think that probably they were able to find a places where the soil was three or four inches deep, and then you had sand under it, which would make spading that up a lot easier. The leveling boards are also a similarity that is kind of curious to me. Uh, the sourcing from the wet meadows, I think is important because all along, and even in Welch's book, he talks about it's far superior to cut your sod when it's wet because it holds together better. Um, it, and if you've, all, if you've dug into dirt that's dry as a bone compared to dirt that's wet, there's a huge difference. Now in the case of Fort Kearney being out on that bottom, it could be that they were able to just slice between the sand and the earth part, which would make cutting perhaps even easier. Uh, this is a wet meadow out on the Platte River very near uh, to Fort Kearney. It's only a three or four miles probably to the east. But those wet meadows in many cases are old channels, old river channels. Uh, but the interesting thing about that is a lot of people who built Saudis talk about building them out of buffalo wallows. Well, it's got to be a pretty big buffalo wallow because even a small house requires at least an acre of sod. And so I'm throwing out another theory, which John will prob probably address, that the buffalo wallow was really a playa, an old playa. And a lot of those wetlands have been lost. I think Nebraska can say that the old wetlands that used to exist in the old days are 90% gone now. Um, so I, and, and a playa would remain moist longer than, a, than dry land or upland. And they always did try to cut their sod off of a low area. Um, another thing is most assuredly, 
they were spading the sod at Fort Kearney, digging it by hand. The plows that we all talk about and that Welch picks up with in his book and other people also pick up with, manufactured plows or blacksmith made plows that made the cutting easier and allowed you to produce big bricks up to three feet long, 18 inches wide, those were not developed. I mean, the earliest ones that we found, evidence of were like early 1880s, I think. So up until the time that a plow is developed, you're looking at spade construction, and spade construction does not allow you to produce huge bricks. Uh, this is a house that was built in the 1870s. I think it's out of Butcher's book. It's got a butcher identification on it. You notice the kind of the shed roof form, very crude, uh, could have easily been adopted from looking at Fort Kearney, but you see all the bricks. None of those bricks are very large. Uh, fun thing to play with. Uh, here's a very fine house, but you see the leveling board that I pointed out in the Albuquerque house as well. That house in Albuquerque, by the way, was built around 1850, a couple of years after Fort Kearney was built. Uh, and then to play further, and this is something um, that needs more work, but I want to, that the, the roof looks like it's long strips of sod, but if you go in, you can see, and sorry, I didn't have a high res to start with, but you can see the size of the bricks right here. And if you start to look at keys to putting a scale to this, We've got the spade length and a hoe length to use as examples, the thickness of that piece of wood, the thickness of the header, probably an inch and a half, inch and three quarters here, three quarters of an inch here, taking the length of those handles up against the wall. This table is about 30, 32 inches high, less than 24 inches wide. And you can see pretty much it's the length of the longest length of the brick of, of a brick in this particular case. So let's say a 20 inch brick by eight inches by three inches using all of these scale features. It's a pretty small brick and easily could have been dug up with this particular spade. I don't know why that spade is there. A spade is not used in garden work, I don't think. So this kind of thing where you we can get uh, high quality images made, we might be able to start piecing together a little bit more brick size and comparing the evolution of the brick from the Tyrone into the fully developed sod construction that we're all more familiar with. Well, isn't that fun? I particularly like this because we've always thought that our history was the story of something that happened from east to west. And now if sod houses are a south to north migration and the cattle industry is a south to north migration, we've really got a different geography to address and a really different way of looking at the cultural items that came up here. <coughs> now I've got two things to do and I don't know what, what kind of time do we have? 20 minutes, 20 minutes perfect. Um, I just want to run quickly through some stuff that some of you may have seen before, the things that we did being able to analyze photographs with digital imaging and I want to use that to remind you that the kind of analysis that Dave was doing with that last sod house actually being able to figure out brick sizes and things like that is something that's made possible by this technology. Now again, as a reminder, the thing about high resolution scans is that they see better than the human eye sees. And so in cases of photographs like this, we've been able to uh, go up to the door, select it out and adjust the uh, levels in the image and actually be able to inventory what's going on on the inside. 
And one of the important things that we will see over and over and over again is these people who are living in what many say is, is a crude, sawed house, in fact, we're tricking them out to be their palace. And so the way we should be looking at these people is not these heroes doing battle against a harsh environment, but rather people who are taking what they have and building their dream house out of it. And I'm going to go through these quickly so I have enough time to talk about the other fun stuff. Um, the inventory of stuff allows us to ask really interesting questions about uh, the social life. For example, that's a broom there. Well, as I've asked many times, how many times do you sweep a dirt floor before it's not dirty anymore? <laughs> it's quite a conundrum. Um, I've recently learned, I've recently proved, I've always suspected, that in this period, um, the reason when Lincoln was established, they built the university, the uh, what they then called the insane asylum and the penitentiary and the seat of government. The university building didn't grow, the capital didn't grow, the penitentiary didn't grow, but the insane asylum exploded. And there's now pretty good evidence that one of the reasons for that is that women particularly uh, just dealt with, the, just fell apart under the pressure of living in, this case, a house you could not get clean, far from seeing uh, another human face for weeks, maybe months at a time. The isolation and what you might perceive as desolation uh, really caused a lot of emotional breakdowns and uh, you, you don't have to look hard to see how between 1872 and uh, 1888 that state hospital just grew by leaps and bounds. It was amazing. Um, we can ask wonderful sociological questions. Why, if you're going to be in the picture, don't you just come outside and be in the picture? Uh, because clearly you're there. Um, and clearly dressed to be in the photograph. Uh, my, my point with all of this is not to answer questions, but to say these are all questions that now arise from uh, the work folks have been doing, like this one. Now, again, look at how nicely decked out that house is. This is clearly a place where People are making it a proper place to live. And of course the big story is the very common scene of a uh, bed in front of the front door um, which causes us to ask all sorts of important questions about what their sense of security was. You know when you read the reminiscences you hear about, oh, there were bandits and there were wild animals and there were Indians riding around. And the fact of the matter is, um, the only reason that those stories exist is that, uh, and I'm going to beg your indulgence, I developed hay fever a couple years ago and it's driving me nuts. So I'll, I'll ask for your forgiveness. Um, <coughs> clearly the reason you'd put your bed in front of the front door is because it's the biggest opening in the house and on a hot July night you open it up to let the cool breezes in uh, so that you can sleep comfortably. Well, if you're worried about neighbors peeking in, wild animals coming in, Indians coming around, you wouldn't do that. Your door would be closed so that you had some sense of security. You know, your 
sleeping through this. The reason I think that uh, those stories uh, uh, endure is not because they were commonplace, but that they were so extraordinary. Those were the things that everybody remembered. So you had one person in a county have an encounter with a bandit or a pack of coyotes or some Indians. That's the story that gets told over and over and over again. That's the one that gets written down in the history book. So that isn't the story of the everyday. That's the extraordinary story. And of course, we can do things at a scale now that allow us to see uh, the smaller little details that let us look for pictures within pictures. And again, that's kind of what David was doing um, with some of his photographs to be able to microanalyze this now ancient data, although with that comparison of he and I having a combined 80 years worth of experience makes it not seem all that distant <laughs> or ancient. So again, here, the, the plaster walls on the inside, the uh, curtains on the wall, nice little baby chair. Yeah. Uh, again, you can, you can see that here are people who really had a notion of the kind of life they wanted to live. And that's probably as good or better than they were going to get in the urban areas of the United States, Chicago, New York, places of that nature. Very nice bed, again, right in front of the front door. Plastered wall. Now, that plastered wall becomes important, and I'll talk about that later. Okay, and again, being able to look at things at a large scale, literally being able to take a telescope into the past. You have a house that, you know, look at what this is in the photograph. You know, it's probably that big in the photograph. You know, maybe half an inch across, maybe. Uh, but you can see it very nicely. And you can see people that were, again, otherwise invisible. That the little red box is where those kids are standing in the overall frame. And then this is one of my favorite pieces because that uh, red box on this photograph uh, is the door. And you can see the door is a very nice door. Clearly store-bought. But here's what's better. With a little bit of dinking around, you can see the woman standing on the inside of it looking back at the guy who's taken the photograph. Okay, so we can take these old historical objects and uh, examine them and learn from them, but uh, we're now embarking on uh, an opportunity to maybe look even further. Um, out in uh, Northeast Custer County, there is a family, and I'm not going to mention the name because I don't have their permission to, and it's always bad form uh, to tell people where places where you might find antiques or things like that are uh, in rural areas. That's just a good way not to make friends. But at any rate, they contacted us because uh, they have an old sod house that was absolutely falling in. Uh, it happens to be right in front of the new house they've just built. And the lady of the house really would like to see something other than a derelict building when she gets up in the morning. I guess that's understandable. Well, there is nothing to save with this building. Let me show you a picture of it. Uh, this is it. It's 
back in all the shrubs, we can look a little closer. Um, this building was probably built around 1902, um, and clearly a sod house in very bad condition. It's, it's going whether, no matter what, there's no salvaging this. But what we're hoping to do, well, what we are going to do, um, is salvage a big chunk of this building and do an autopsy on it. Because you heard David talk about um, the problems of growing different kinds of plants that will eventually knit themselves into sod. It doesn't just happen everywhere and not every kind of dirt will produce a sod suitable for a sod house. And so the question becomes, just what is that dirt? We have conjecture, you know, the old buffalo wallow theory, um, or the wetlands, or, you know, whatever. But our plan is <coughs> to uh, go out and take a 4 by 8 section, 4 by 8 foot section of the wall, sandwich it between two pieces of plywood, bolt it together, wrap it in plastic, and load it up and bring it to Lincoln and take it out to East Campus. And there we can let some botanists uh, have a go at it and some soil specialists to see exactly what's there. And the reason we want to take a big section of the wall is if you think about it as though it was an archaeological site, those strata may tell you something. Well, you can presume that the sod at the bottom was cut before the sod at the top, <coughs> and that if they came from one place, <coughs> they uh, probably have some continuity up and down that we'll be able to see. So, taking it out where we can actually dismantle it as a wall, taking it down as it was put up, should be very instructive. Um, one of the really cool things that uh, they're talking about doing is sifting seeds out of it and see if any of those just now century old seeds will sprout to see if we can grow 100 year old uh, grass. Um, we're also going to go out and try and take either core samples or dig cross sections to see just exactly what <coughs> the strata of uh, the land around it looks like and see actually how much real difference there is from one place to another and that I think will tell us a lot. Um, we're also going to look for uh, remnants of critters, mouses and snakes and all those things. I've uh, been talking with uh, Larkin Powell out on East Campus. He's with the Institute, Agri well everybody is, Institute of Agri uh, Agriculture and Natural Resources. And he's dealing primarily with birds and with prairie birds. And that led him and his colleagues into an interest in what the difference was um, between the land where you mow grass and the land where you don't. And they've done some surveys and discovered that in fields that are mowed, um, there are more bull snakes there than there are in fields where they are not mowed. And not just a few, a hundred percent more. Okay, why is that? Well, when you mow the grass, you save the crowns, and that's really sweet nibblings for little rodents. And of course, rodents are the major prey of a bull snake, 
And so in come the rodents, and following them come the rodent predators, since people have chased off the prairie dogs. And so now you have mouses and snakes. Well, that would be a very interesting thing to know in light of the fact that there are so many stories, uh, uh, particularly about the reptiles, where you have reptiles that poke their head out of a sod wall or drop in from the ceiling or are regularly found around the place. Again, by mowing and plowing, what people, I think, created is a, per a, a perfect rodent habitat and a perfect uh, reptile habitat. And so um, in talking with these folks, I'm thinking that probably if you were going to talk about what really changed the dynamics of the prairie, the ecology of the prairie, it might be mowing over plowing. Obviously both had their effects, but um, when you cut the grass you really do change uh, the kinds of animals uh, that are living there. So um, we hope with the ability to take an actual sod house and go take it apart and put the eyeballs of some really good scientists to work on it, uh, that we will learn a lot more uh, about what the structure of the sod is, what the, uh, uh, what the nature of the sod house is, uh, you know, what it is that actually held it together. We'll also be able to do things like take it apart so we can actually study their construction techniques. Um, uh, uh, Luann Wanschneider, who's head of the anthropology department at the university, is going to bring some, a small group of young scholars out and we're going to see what we can find also in terms of uh, uh, cultural materials. Uh, do at least a surface survey of materials, maybe a, uh, a little bit of searching for possible archaeological sites or things of that nature where uh, we might be able to put that together with what we learned about the physical building and again have a much better view of the uh, what the life was like, actually. And then finally, not far from there, there is a, a sod house that's standing and in very good condition. And so we're going to go out and look at that and document it, see how close it comes to matching the remains of this one, and that will again give us a, uh, a wonderful specimen for, uh, for later examination. So all of these uh, things, the new theories about where sod houses came from, how they got here. No, one thing David did not mention, uh, Patrick Haynes has done a map locating the known sod houses in Nebraska. And they've got, when, when you look at the map, just the little dots on a piece of paper, they're literally a sneeze pattern out from Fort Kearney. So, uh, yeah, you know, coincidence maybe, but uh, uh, I, I kind of think there's got to be something going on there. Uh, so that's our now uh, our, our new look at that little old side shanty, and both David and I would be more than happy to answer any questions you might have, sir. I have a picture of the side house that my grandmother was born in, and it appears as though the that maybe the floor inside the house is lower than ground level outside. I think that I saw a picture here that was the same way. So uh, <clears throat> was that maybe a common practice that they had to take the side off of the floor? Do you want to address that? or? Well, you'd have to clear it for the floor. Why don't you get on mic so that uh, people on television can hear what you have to say? You'd have to clear it for a floor, and you'd have to level it. So. Oftentimes, they're, it's very difficult to find a perfectly level site, so you'd, they'd be semi-dug out at least on one side, not the 
picture you're talking about actually looks like it is dug in. I mean, it's not, it's dug in all around, and I, why that would have, why they would have done that, I don't know. It would make less wall. It would make less wall, that's true. In that case, maybe two or three courses, that's quite a bit, actually. Concept of the roof, the ridge pole or beam, rafters coming off of that. What were used as purlins to keep the sod from coming through to the interior? On the roof, mm -hmm. well, they started out with smaller, smaller branches over the beams, and then they would put layers of grass and leaves over that, and then dirt and sod over the, uh, uh, off the top. So there really isn't anything keeping the water from coming in, <laughs> ultimately. I mean, the sod would soak up a certain amount, and it would soak up a pretty good rain, I suspect, although then gravity is still going to pull it through, and eventually it's going to drip. Smaller branches for the structure, right? Yeah. yeah. And then later on, when lumber is available, then, and even tar paper and so forth, then it gets better. Without exception, um, I noticed in the, in the Mexican uh, sod uh, bricks, as well as more recent Great Plains sod bricks, the grass on the brick is always on the bottom as a tension member, not in the kind of natural form where we find the grass on top of the sod. Actually, we don't know why, but that is one thing I forgot to mention, because terrones are always laid grass side down. Now, when you, and the sods out here are. And I, I always justified that to myself. Well, you got this big brick, the plow turned it over. You're not going to mess around turning it back and forth, so you just put it in the wall that way. But when the Taronis are always laid grass side down, I, there's another little connection that, and nobody knows why, actually. Anybody who's laid sod realizes if you turn the sod to the grass down, it holds together better. It does? Oh, sure, now, because oh, of that. Right. Of course, the Tyrone, you know, you can almost hold the whole thing in two hands, so I don't know. True, true. Uh, would you spell, spell Tyrone? T E R R O N is a singular, and then E S on the end is plural. <clears throat> Just a comment to follow up on your how often can you sweep and before it gets clean? My father was born in a south shanty. And his comment on that was, after his mother sweep, swept that floor many, many times, it became just like brick. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And that is something you hear quite often. And some people talk about how it actually becomes shiny after you've stomped on it enough and swept it often enough. But shiny dirt is still dirt. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, so, the, 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 the technical problem I understand, the psychological problem I think is the one that, mm. that's quite daunting. Matt? Um, are there any sod construction sites you're aware of where like the family history has survived that they know exactly where <coughs> on the adjacent property the material came from to build the house where you could actually go there today and, and sample those species of grasses? That, I, I have not. That doesn't mean they don't exist. And that's one of the things that when we go out to work on this house we're going to autopsy, we're going to go sample. Um, the, the one thing that I think is sure as sunrise is that up here they didn't allow it to grow back to sod. That once you had that ground nice and clean, it had corn in it. Uh, so, you know, the fact of the matter is that, that it changed rather dramatically once it got harvested. And you can also bet they probably didn't build the house too far away from where they were cutting it. So no. <laughs> Although there are photographs of people hauling it in wagons, loading it on wagons and bringing it in, but I, I would think, too, that just would not be very practical. It all depends on your site. I mean, and the the property you own. If 
if you're on a yeah. totally upland site, you're going to have to probably buy sod rights from somebody who has some bottom land. Or... Uh, my grandparents lived in the sod house in Custer County. And uh, their first child was born. And, uh, when it rained hard, it was a problem of keeping the child dry. <laughs> And with the, the dirt floors. It was a now see, all those roofs down in New Mexico are sod as well, but of course they don't get the kind of rain we get. And okay, I think we should have a question. I just make one more comment about the, uh, the women's problem. Uh, if you lived in a building with no windows and mm -hmm. very little light, I think that would quickly get to you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there were, there were a lot of factors that contributed yeah. to that. They didn't have windows in the early ones. Well, thank you all very much for coming. We appreciate it.